Hi, this is Peter Svidler for Chess24, and uh, in this video I will be uh, covering the Bishop C4 Grunfeld, uh, a line which uh, has been uh, sort of universally popular over the course of uh, the existence, I think, of the Grunfeld defense, and uh, a line uh, which uh, I always uh, enjoyed looking at, even if I uh, didn't always enjoy the, the, the results of my, of my analysis, because the, the, the play is very, very interesting. And uh, I wanted to do something slightly different uh, for, for, for these two videos. I think there will be um, uh, two covering this line. Uh, what I wanted to do here is, although there will be quite a lot of uh, actual theory, I wanted to give you sort of an evolution of my views on the line and an evolution of uh, my attitudes towards certain positions and towards uh, the correct way of, of, of dealing with this line. Um, so, with that in mind, let's, let's get to, uh, to the chess. Uh, bishop c4, c5, uh, 92, 96, uh, bishop e3 is uh, quite forced. And in this position, I uh, once or twice, and against decent opposition, I tried uh, a fancy line, starting with stakes, stakes, check, and queen d8. Uh, it looks a bit odd, frankly, but uh, the point is, uh, if white doesn't want an immediate repetition, which he normally doesn't, has to play bishop c3, which is not an, a custom diagonal for this bishop, and play uh, becomes uh, very non-standard and uh, very fresh. But I don't think it fully equalizes, so I'm not recommending this. Black should castle in this position. And uh, here, white normally castles, but there are two other moves uh, you need to consider. One is h4, to which black, I, th I believe, should just reply uh, queen a5, king of one b6, h5. Uh, bishop a6, and in this position there have been a number of games by uh, Grandmaster Nicolaidis, which I believe sufficiently cover everything that's going on in this position, so uh, I will not go into too much detail, you will find the games and the analysis in the files, and uh, those I believe are, are more than sufficient for, uh, they will be all you need to know uh, about this line is what I wanted to say. A more serious alternative uh, to, to castling is rook c1, to which black normally takes, plays queen a5 check, king f1. And the theory of this line uh, uh, used to start exclusively with bishop d7 and then, let's say, h4. Uh, and uh, th this position is very, very sharp and very unclear. And it appealed, I think, to white players a lot because uh, it changed the the course of, of uh, the game uh, a lot from your know, normal Grunfeld fair. But then black discovered that in, in a position after king f1 they could play uh, queen a3. The point of this move is uh, twofold. First of all, h4 is now very well met by bishop g4 and f3 is just impossible because the bishop is hanging. And secondly, black wants to play knight a5, attacking the, the pride and joy of white's position, the bishop on c4. A very beautiful line I wanted to show you here is queen d2, rook d8, d5, knight e5, bishop b5, creating seemingly a very strong threat of uh, bishop c5, but black just plays a6, and after bishop c5, he has queen f3, a move I think uh, every one of us would like to uh, be able to make on the board once in, in our career. And if gf, bishop h3 check, and black collects all the material back with dividends, so that's not really very critical. And after queen a3, white normally plays rook c3, queen d6, h4. And in this position I played rook d8 uh, against Alexander Morozovich in the Astana uh, Blitz tournament, or possibly rapid. And after h5, I, I failed to uh, control the vehicle, so to speak, and lost a very pretty miniature. But uh, instead of this, black should just play h5. And after the possible f3, rook d8, uh, bishop d5, and for instance e5, the game is very complex, but I believe black should be fine here. Uh, so castles, and uh, this of course is uh, uh, the main position of the bishop c4 line. And here black has a variety of choices. Um, first of all, uh, the uh, most popular over the course of the years, I think, the most popular move here is bishop g4, which after f3, uh, knight a5, leads to a uh, very, very forcing and very uh, well-researched lines, uh, both after bishop takes f7 and especially after bishop d3, take, take, bishop e6, and now d5, bishop a1, queen a1. 
Now, this position has been a subject of very high level theoretical discussions, uh, well, uh, for donkey's years, so to speak. Uh, and uh, I believe currently it's supposed to be a draw, but uh, it never really appealed to me all that much because, frankly, uh, there is, a, unless white makes a huge mistake somewhere, there's never any suggestion black uh, might be better here. White always has enough, enough compensation for some sort of uh, equality or simply put draw. And uh, the idea of having to memorize uh, 35 to 40 move forced lines to make a forced draw and if, uh, God forbid, you forget something or uh, uh, something goes mildly wrong in your preparation and you just uh, die without making a move at the board, uh, all this uh, has never been my idea of fun, and uh, I will not be recommending this line for you. Although, uh, just for sort of general knowledge, and there's a lot of very beautiful variations there, you might simply uh, browse through the, the high-level games played in this line over the past 10 years, so to speak. Uh, apart from that, Black has another uh, couple of options uh, I tried over, over the course of my career. One is B6. This I played against Magnus Carlsen in the Town Memorial in 2011. And after DC5, uh, Queen C7, he went F4 and was soon even fighting for equality. Uh, and the game was eventually drawn. Um, I, I still believe B6 is a very, very playable move and there's nothing wrong with it. But the problem with it and the reason I will, I'm just mentioning it and not going into any kind of detail is that after the main move knight D4, uh, I believe black holds but uh, what he holds are a number of endgames a pawn down, uh, of which white has a choice, actually. Uh, uh, white has to even, even pick one of the endgames where he will be a pawn, uh, a pawn up. And, and then uh, I think black should have enough for equality, but frankly, uh, the idea of holding uh, an endgame a pawn down, even if you uh, do fully believe it is holdable, is not to everybody's taste, and uh, it's uh, okay to do it every now and then, especially in a game where you're not really a uh, favorite to win uh, to begin with, as was, frankly, in my game against Carlsen, although against him a passive position upon down is also not an ideal solution, but uh, there you go. But in a normal game, I think uh, going for an endgame like this uh, is not anybody uh, or everybody's cup of tea, so I'm not recommending this. Uh, and uh, another, another way of uh, playing here for black is knight a5, uh, bishop d3, b6, which I'm proud to say I was the original event inventor of, uh, mainly uh, due to absolutely murderous jet lag. This was uh, a game I, I played against Veselin Tapalov in a Morelia Linares tournament in the Linares leg. Uh, so as, as it is easy to understand, this wasn't even the first jet lag, it was the second one. And it was, it was absolutely uh, unbearable. Uh, I couldn't sleep at all. And, and when I did sleep, uh, I felt uh, completely uh, tired. And uh, the idea of preparing for, for games just didn't appeal to me at all. So uh, I would just turn up at the board and then uh, tell myself, OK, this is a position I have to find a move in. Uh, let's find some move. Uh, so when Tapalov uh, uh, played the, the classical Grunfeld against me, which he has done on a number of occasions previously, I thought, okay, he probably has something prepared against the lines I played against him uh, on, all, on all those previous uh, occasions. Let's uh, create something new. And I went knight a5 and b6 with the idea of playing e5 after rook c1. Uh, and uh, this line has, since that game, exploded into uh, into one of the main lines of the Grunfeld. Uh, there has been uh, a lot of really, really important developments. It has been played in a World Championship match between Tapalov and Anand, and uh, in a number of very, very high-level games outside of the cycle. But I left it altogether after that first game because I thought, uh, okay, I, I created this and it now has a life of its own, but it's not much fun for me to join the the clicking party, so to speak, uh, when everybody's doing it. So uh, this is now uh, living its absolutely separate life uh, without me. Uh, 
the move I, I generally make in this position and the move I almost but not quite recommend making in this position is bishop d7. What I mean by almost but not quite is, is, is this. Uh, black can and by now I think should play bishop g3 and only play bishop d7 after f3. I of course have, have been aware of this possibility for a number of years, well pretty much uh, for, for the entirety of my Grunfeld career, but it has always uh, seemed to me that this is just a waste of a tempo and uh, why would you force white to make uh, the move f2, f3, which he generally likes to move in this kind of a structure, it supports the center and uh, um, it just seemed somewhat illogical to me to be forcing white into a move which uh, really doesn't look like a drawback. So I would just play uh, bishop d7 here and uh, I think it was to my detriment that I never uh, considered carefully the, the implications of uh, forcing white to go f3 and I think now that uh, it's better to start with bishop g4 and I will try over the course of the, the, these two videos to explain uh, exactly why. Not in every line it makes a, a huge bit of difference, but there are some lines in which it makes quite, quite a bit of a difference. And I will try to, to, to point those out to you. But I will start with uh, the move I uh, generally make in this position, bishop d7, and uh, show you the way the, the, the understanding of this line developed over the years. When I just started playing this position with black, people will just automatically play rook c1 here because this is how you were brought up, so to speak. You, you develop the bishop to e3 in this line and then you put the rook on c1 because it supports the bishop on c4 in, in, in case black takes on d4 and just generally it looks very very natural and very harmonious and, and why not. To this black replies rook c8 and uh, now people will just play queen g2 just on, on those same general grounds. Uh, because this is how you completed your development in this line. However, here black plays queen a5. He already threatened c takes d4, uh, uh, liquidating into a very good endgame. And here white could play queen b2, as for instance uh, Mikhail Prusikin did against me. But after b6, black is already quite comfortable, I believe, and I, I managed to even win that game. And if white goes d5 here, as was played in one of the very first games again. I, I played in this line in, in, uh, in a junior tournament uh, more than 20 years ago. I played knight e5, bishop b3, and now uh, an important motif I want to uh, sort of draw your attention to. Almost never do you want to play c5, c4 in this line. In general you want instead to try and put the knight on c4, and here queen a6 does just that. Black wants to play knight c4, this creates, uh, well, immediate problems because uh, this will uh, mean white will have to find squares for uh, all of his pieces and perhaps uh, maybe he will be forced to part with one of the bishops. Also, with the knight on c4 it's much easier to play for the e6 break because the bishop on b3 is somewhat neutralized. And uh, finally, it's important to note that if you manage to force white to play c4 in a position like this, then b5 becomes a huge factor and black gets tremendous counterplay. So rook c1, rook c8, queen d2 is not very uh, threatening and in this position the only move that has uh, any kind of separate, uh, separate meaning is f4. Which, uh, this move has been played by uh, Alexander Bilevsky uh, in a game against Sedlak and uh, here black played bishop g4 which I believe is a correct move. But I want to point out that black has a very uh, forcing sequence here starting with takes takes and bishop g4, d5 and now a very nice geometrical move knight d4, which after takes, takes queen e2, bishop takes d4 leads to simplifications, but not to equality. And uh, this is a kind of a position you want to avoid because black does manage to uh, exchange quite a lot of pieces, but the pieces that do remain on the board favor white uh, a lot. And the bishop will be very, very strong on b3, and white will have uh, a serious initiative uh, both in the center and on the king's side potentially. So this is just not equal and cannot be recommended at all for black. Therefore bishop g4 immediately, d5, knight a5, bishop d3, black immediately breaks in the center. And now the main move is h3. Uh, as a side note, in general if you play e6 in this system and you attack the g5 pawn and uh, white replies by playing c4, it is almost always uh, 
uh, required to play b5 straight away because you cannot allow white to, to keep uh, this beautiful center for any longer than is absolutely necessary. And here it holds true as well. White could play, let's say, h3, to which the possible reply is exchange all these pieces. Uh, and in this position you play rook d8, for instance, rook fd1, and knight b7. And although uh, you could perhaps argue that white has a slight advantage here, in general black's uh, defensive resources should be more than enough to make a draw. Uh, so the main move here is h3, bishop e2, bishop e2, e d5, e d5. If white takes with a queen, uh, the best way to proceed is to take, take, play rook e8, king f2, and now black is just in time. If white had one more move, he would probably be better. But here, very strong is rook e4, creating a threat of rook c8, an idea of knight c4, and also this rook will go to a4 is if, if it's driven away, which is a very good square for, for the rook, obviously, and black has enough card to play here. And if e d5, black plays rook e8, queen d2, and uh, in this position it's very important, of course, not to allow d5, d6, so black plays queen d6. Uh, if he's uh, given free reign here, he might consider playing f5, boxing in box of both of white's bishops, therefore f5, queen e5, rook f3. And uh, in this position, uh, black has, I believe, forcing, uh, forced equality after both rook d8 and c5, c4. I will give you a sample line. After rook d8, white has to play, let's say, fg, hg. Let's include that, although it doesn't really make much of a difference. Rook d1. Uh, obviously, if uh, c4, black has a very important resource, knight c6, and the knight triumphantly returns to the action. So rook d1, queen c3, and now after the following forcing sequence, um, black is, I think, just in time to attack the, the central pawn on d5, and uh, uh, due to the fact that white is, uh, will find it a bit awkward uh, defending this pawn, the, the most likely result is, is a draw. And if uh, black plays c4 here, uh, a possible line might go fg, hg, d6, rook d8, rook d1, and now queen takes c3, queen takes c3, bishop takes c3, white plays, for instance, d7, rook e7, and bishop takes a7. Now the bishop on c3 is hanging, bishop b6 is a big idea, but black calmly replies knight c6, uh, intending to meet bishop b6 with bishop d4 check, and uh, he, he has uh, easy equality here. This is not uh, completely forced, but I just wanted to give you uh, a sample of how black should be dealing with, with this position. It's important that he plays very, very forcefully because, as I said, in general, uh, uh, white has uh, a potentially unpleasant initiative and you need to be, you need to be very, very concrete. But f4, I believe, holds for black. And so we, uh, uh, I think, uh, have sufficiently covered rook c1 and we can switch to the main move which you are very, very likely to face if you play the bishop d7 systems, namely rook b1. This is uh, by far uh, uh, the biggest option white has. For a number of years I used to play a6 here, uh, which is a move that uh, has uh, a lot of merits, but has uh, two major drawbacks. First of all, after d takes c5, uh, in the very concrete play that follows, uh, I'm not sure black gets full equality. And secondly, and somehow, somehow more importantly for me, because I normally don't mind giving away material, uh, d5 is a huge problem, because I think the position after knight e5, bishop b3, is just very, very unpleasant. As I said, uh, it is normally not to black's uh, benefit to play c5, c4, so he tries to avoid it here. But after f4, knight g4, bishop c1, it transpires that in order not to be driven off the board completely after h3 and d5, black still has to play c4, and now, for instance, e6, and uh, what you get is a position like this, h3, knight f6, for instance, d6, bishop e6, knight d4, and I believe you must try and avoid positions like this at, a, at every cost in this system, because white will have a, a tremendous attack on the king side in most cases here, and very, very fast, because there's really not a lot of counterplay for black, and white can develop his initiative uh, on, on the king side completely unimpeded. Uh, so after rook b1, uh, I think black has to play queen c7, and in this position white has at the very least uh, seven possible moves, two of which, bishop d3 and bishop f4, will be a subject of a separate video, uh, and I will not cover in this one. 
But in this one, I want to briefly cover uh, uh, the other five. Let's start with f4, which is uh, by far the easiest. You just take on d4 twice. Uh, it's important to note that uh, in this line, uh, the piece is not back because after queen d7, black has queen takes e2. So uh, after knight d4, white normally plays bishop f7, rook f7, bishop takes d4, and now e5. And after the possible sequence ending with queen takes f1, black plays bishop c6 and attacks uh, both of the uh, e pawns and should be fine here. So f4 is uh, not a particularly threatening idea. Uh, neither is d takes c5 because you just play knight a5, bishop d3 and rook fd8, uh, planning to play e6 and bishop f8. And uh, it's important to note that uh, compared to the a6 line, black is uh, very, very far ahead uh, because A, he made a very useful move, rook queen c7, instead of a, a move a6. And secondly, a6 is, uh, frankly, uh, uh, has negative value, because in this position with the pawn on a6, black has to, on each and every move, calculate the idea c6, uh, followed by bishop b6, and uh, white generally wins some material. Uh, this position, I believe, should be quite safe for black. Uh, he has a very simple plan of going e6, bishop f8, and bishop takes c5 which is surprisingly difficult to counter. So uh, this is also not very critical. Uh, and uh, white has two queen moves in this position. One is queen c1. This has been played in a very high level game between Korobov and Areshenko uh, some years back. Uh, it, this game uh, continued uh, a6, dc5, knight e5, bishop d5. Here black played rook b8, preparing to play uh, e6 and drive the pieces back. White played f4, knight g4, bishop d4, bishop b5, and in this position black had a uh, uh, terrific play for the pawn. None of this is particularly forced, I just wanted to show you uh, what uh, good chess players thought about this position. It's also possible just to play rook ac8, rook fd1, and for instance take on d4, take on d4 and play a6, planning to expand on, on the queen side. Generally speaking, this uh, should not be uh, too, mu too much of a problem for, for black. Uh, white's play is just too vague to, to create uh, too, much, uh, too much uncertainty for black here. So uh, this is queen c1. Another queen move is queen d2, to which you should just reply rook a d8. Now the main and, and the correct move for white here, I suppose, is bishop d3. But this transposes to the 12th bishop d3 and will therefore be the subject of video number two. Uh, it's just important to know that if white good plays bishop h6, which would make a lot of sense positionally, he runs afoul of some tactics. Takes, takes, cd4, cd4, and now very strong is bishop g4, creating a huge threat of knight takes d4. And if knight f4, knight takes d4 anyway, and it transpires that after knight takes g6, black has a tremendously strong resource in queen d6, and uh, white loses material. So uh, bishop h6 is impossible, and therefore bishop d3 uh, transposing to something else is the main move after queen d2. And we're left with the uh, final uh, possibility here, namely knight f4. Uh, knight f4 used to, uh, well, worry would be perhaps a, a bit of a strong word, but uh, this used to bug me in the old days, because uh, you were supposed to play queen c8, and uh, my game against Bilavsky in the Gibraltar Masters in 09 went bishop b2, and here I made uh, a number of moves along the 8th eighth, uh, eighth rank because, frankly, there aren't uh, too many other moves available for black. Rook b8, queen d2, rook d8, rook fc1, bishop e8. Uh, finally, uh, white decided to settle the structure and went d5. I went b6. Once again, it's important to note that the knight should vacate the c6 square only when completely forced to because you don't really want to allow c4, and uh, now c4 will allow knight d4, which is, of course, not white's idea. And then uh, the, the game uh, became very, very sharp, and I even won it in the end. But in general, uh, I'm not entirely convinced by all this uh, Aikido approach to chess, you know, uh, trying to use your opponent's strength against him and, and, and not doing anything in the center or, or attempting any active, uh, any active play until white commits his, his hand. Is, uh, is a possible approach, of course, but I, I, I'm not entirely convinced this is good. But after knight f4, I'm recommending a move which uh, I, I think gives black interesting new possibilities, rook a c8. The point of this is that uh, white, by playing knight f4, sort of announces he wants to go knight d5. 
whereas uh, in actual fact after knight g5 queen g8 it turns out that uh, if you take on b7 there's constantly uh, knight a5 uh, hitting both the rook and the knight and the bishop on c4 so rook b7 is not an immediate threat whereas e7 e6 is and, and therefore uh, knight f4 quite possibly or after rook c8 might might turn out to be just a waste of a tempo so rook a c8 with uh, some uh, potential continuations from this position on uh, is what I uh, recommend you play here and there's uh, some additional material on this in the files as it is this video is already uh, running uh, slightly long so I will cut it off here uh, video number two will uh, will be dedicated to uh, rook b1 queen c7 bishop f4 and rook b1 queen c7 bishop d3 in this position those are very very serious moves and uh, they've given me a lot of trouble uh, over the years, so uh, they will require uh, a lot of attention and uh, please uh, stay tuned to, to watch the second part. Uh, thanks for listening, this has been uh, Peter Svidla for Chess24.